relatively early for a Dragon Con Monday uh, talk on MC Catchers slash Cell Site Simulators um, slash a number of other terms that they use. I'll get into. Um, I'm Bill Buddington. Uh, I am a senior staff technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, where we work on a number of projects, uh, including alerting people to the usage of cell site simulators and uh, fighting back against them. Um, and uh, so I guess I'll first, as kind of form of introduction, what is a cell site simulator? Uh, I'll kind of read off of our SLS page. So that's street level surveillance, sls.eff.org. Um, that cell site simulators, also known as stingrays or MC catchers, are devices that masquerade as legitimate cell phone towers, uh, tricking phones within certain radius into connecting to the device rather than a legitimate cell phone tower. Uh, CSSs operate by conducting a general search of cell phone uh, cells within the device's radius in violation of basic constitutional protections. So more on this point, um, general searches uh, are, uh, general warrants are a kind of, a, you know, a, a form, uh, it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. And so they're not allowed in the U.S. generally. So we uh, think that the use of cell site simulators um, for law enforcement purposes is unconstitutional. Um, law enforcement uses cell site simulators to pinpoint the location of phones with greater accuracy than phone companies without uh, than phone companies without needing to involve a phone company at all. And cell site simulators can also log MC numbers. And MC, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, is uh, the International Mobile Subscriber Identity. And that's a universally unique uh, identifier. It's 64-bit um, uh, universally unique identifier for uh, for your device. Um, so every single device on Earth has a different embassy. Um, and so that's useful for anyone that wants to track you because um, then they can tie that embassy together and know what where you're going and your location. So... That's kind of the general gist of what an MC catcher slash cell site simulator slash stingray slash a whole other um, bunch of terms, this kind of class of um, devices do. And um, so stingray particularly is out of that, that um, range of, of terms is a uh, kind of a brand name. So I say uh, I need to put a band aid on it. Right. Um, so that's a band aid. It's a brand name, just like stingray is. Um, and Stingrays are kind of the larger devices that are produced by the Harris Corporation, or L3 Harris now Corporation, um, that, uh, that do this kind of work. Um, there's also a number of other products that they manufacture, the Harris manufacturers. Uh, one is called a, King, a Kingfish, which is a smaller device to do this. Um, the smaller devices generally have less range and are uh, less, a little bit less capable um, of doing that work. Um, so how does an MC catcher actually work? Um, so there's a, is it the, um, the, it'll either downgrade your connection. So most phones, if you're using your, uh, your normal cellular connection, if you have a modern phone, then it's usually on like a 5g, uh, network and using a relatively standard, up-to-date encryption. Uh, what a cell site simulator will do is it will downgrade your connection to 2G, which is using using a an outdated uh, A51, uh, like broken, uh, like a broken cipher, broken um, encryption that's easily intercepted. And so a cell site simulator with, will downgrade your connection to that easy to intercept uh, encryption on 2G, uh, and uh, another technique that they might use is to negotiate a null cipher, which is available even in the modern in, uh, the modern you know, 4G, 5G standards, that just basically chooses no encryption for a um, data connection or phone connection. So there are kind of numerous methods that they'll use, but generally using 2G 
is seen as you know your all bets are off if you're, if you're using 2g um and to this the the uh, phone manufacturers have created some protections so there are some protections that you can use um, if you're using uh, for instance an iphone then you can turn on a lockdown mode and that will uh, disable your use of 2g networks and then you can kind of selectively turn it back on in your settings if you're in a location that only offers 2g um, generally universally in the u.s uh, you know, there's a greater than 2G available. Um, you might in some locations encounter, like outside internationally, might encounter uh, places where there's only 2G available, um, unfortunately. So you might need to like kind of selectively turn it on if you need to make a phone call. Um, in Android, you can, if you have a and more recently implemented, if you have a Pixel uh, 6 or greater, then you can turn off 2G connections um, in your settings, and that will disable you know you your phone opportunistically logging onto 2G networks. Um, so there are some protections that you can take to kind of ensure that your cell phone isn't being uh, unconstitutionally tracked. Um, and the scary thing about this is that it doesn't require collusion uh, with the cell phone company. Um, it basically is an independent device that uh, anyone can run and will trick your phone into connecting to it instead of that, you know, uh, legitimate cell phone tower. So, you know, the latest cell phone standards are trying to address some of these, the, you know, gaping vulnerability, security vulnerability uh, in, in the way that this works. And, um, and, you know, to, to some, to some success and, uh, having higher standards and kind of evolving, uh, with the time you, you see like newer phones that will have capabilities that, uh, allow uh, users to rest assured that their devices aren't going to be delivering data to whatever cellular tower that is in the area that, you know, advertises itself as a cellular tower um you know is going to uh, have to engage in some kind of a verification mechanism so uh, those are some of the protections of phones i want to go into a little bit of the history of how uh, css's have been used by law enforcement and again kind of reading from our page on street level surveillance uh, law enforcement officers and uh, baltimore police used devices for a wide variety of purposes ranging from tracking a kidnapper to locating a man that took his wife's phone during an argument and later returned it to her so um you know that's going to you, they're they're very um you know, they use this with a relatively uh low level of of uh discretion and so this uh, you know used in a wide variety of circumstances um and uh, so Annapolis police used a cell site simulator to investigate a robbery uh, involving $56 worth of submarine sandwiches and chicken wings. So, um, yeah, implementing the latest technology to decrypt your phone isn't just for tracking down that terrorist. It is used for $56 of subway sandwiches as well. Um, so uh you know not to get into uh all the instances but there are a number of other competitors with harris l3 harris that also manufacture these types of devices for law enforcement uh companies such as kw octastic tactical support equipment berkeley veritronics cognite x surveillance atos Rayzone. um there's just kind of a whole slew of these companies that are manufacturing these MC catchers. Um, so uh, I did want to, in a relatively short order, kind of um, open it up to questions and answers that people might have uh, to see what people are interested in hearing about. Um, one of the protections that, that we have developed at EFF is a, a piece of software called Ray Hunter. And that's going to detect 
whether an MC catcher is being used in a uh, certain area. So um, you can get one of these mobile hotspots, uh, mobile cellular hotspots, and it will give you a, a flash and alert. Um, and uh, it will tell you whether you know, it has detected some kind of verifiable mechanisms that you'll know that an MC catcher is being used. For instance, you know, um, choosing a null cipher is kind of a surefire thing that will um, is, is why you know it is is completely one hundred percent used um, indica indicative of the use of. An MC catcher um, downgrading to a 2G connection when uh, 3G connections are are available is another surefire way to know that this is uh, an MC catcher being used. So we're developing the software called Ray Hunter that uh, will kind of let you know. Um, and the most common instances where this is used is not only robberies, but in um, you know internationally, not so much in the U.S. We have seen this. Uh, a little bit in the U.S., but internationally, usually, um, you know, in protest situations where there's civil disturbances, um, so intercepting a, a large swath population. We did see a little bit of a um, cell phone. Uh, well, it was a shutdown uh, rather than a um, you know use of an MC catcher. But um, in the BART protests uh, in 29, 20, 2009, or yeah, two thousand nine, and so um, so the, the kind of a range of technologies being used uh, is is you know in uh, in the U.S. and internationally it is utilizing MC catchers and CSS devices uh, when when law enforcement wants to. So yeah, with that, I'll uh, open it up to the floor to questions uh, that people have, and uh, yeah, just uh, learn more about MC catchers. Again, that URL is SLS. Dot EF app dot org for our street level surveillance uh, and then just tap on the NC catchers slash self site simulators link. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, when you say this is going to downgrade my phone connection, when that sync rate connects to my phone, it's going to downgrade to 2G. Yeah. Will I see 2G in the banner of my phone or yeah. just you'll see 2G. Yeah. I yeah. see 2G. So. Yeah, it'll it'll indicate what uh what generation of cellular connectivity you're using. I'm up I'm up. Correct and assuming that that banner, anything can go in that banner. I mean, I could be connected to a 3G and it still says 5G. I, I think that uh, the icon will reliably indicate what level of network you're on. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yep. When you say it downgrades uh, 5G to force you to a 2G connection, I'm assuming this is a form of interference. If it is, why is this not illegal under uh, FCC rules? Yeah, good question. Uh, so I'm not a lawyer, so uh, I can't answer the particulars of what is in violation of the law there. Um, perhaps uh, someone else in the audience can. Um, kind of, uh, we do have some lawyers in the audience that, that might be able to help with that. Um, I, but uh, So, so, so yeah, oh, yeah. Hello, I am a, a lawyer, I used to work with Bill. Uh, so, in general, if something is uh, uh, lawful uh, and they can, they can do it uh, with, with a warrant and such, then you know, that's not going to be a problem with FCC rules. Now, Think that this is uh, you know, unconstitutional, uh, but probably the FCC is not going to prioritize going after things where the uh, Department of Justice may disagree with them on whether something is constitutional and so on. So I wouldn't expect a lot of FCC enforcement against a U.S. government or a agency or sub, uh, like a state or a local agency using it, but uh, they might go after like a foreign government in, in the United States. Thank you. Actually, for the issue of downgrading the signal, I think that's something that's kind of common. Like if you have a 5G 
and you're in an area that you won't get it, you'll get downgraded to 4G and so on. And I think that's kind of why they're, they're going by being able to do that as part of the normal process of downgrading your signal to something else that'll work. You know, so I think they're allowed to do it from that point of view, but you know, that brings forth the question of whether they should continue allowing to use 2G if they are, no, it's, you know, not secure, you know, because they have out, you know, at least set up rules that at least they're not supposed to use certain things like uh, certain TLS encryption standards, you know, because they know it's not secure. So that might be a way of looking at it, seeing it's like, hey, it's time to stop maybe using 2G if we know it's uh, not secure. Yeah, the network negotiation process um, generally is pretty opportunistic. It'll, you know, uh, before the latest protections were implemented, use whatever it could in order to basically negotiate a connection for your cell phone, both data and uh, and uh, traditional. And so um, the kind of negotiation process, uh, if you have these protections in your phone, uh, will Inter be interrupted and say, okay, uh, I'm not going to offer like a 2G connection. Um, but uh, yeah, it might be a case where the EMC catcher is blocking the 3G or 4G connections, uh, 5G uh, connections in order to say, hey, I have, I have something else to offer instead. So I'm trying to understand the, th uh, the threat model here in terms of regardless of uh, how easy we think law enforcement along these lines should be, presumably uh, there are other ways to get this kind of information. I used to work at a VPN as a service company some time back, and we got subpoenas from law enforcement on a pretty regular basis where they wanted to get information about uh, some of our users who were presumably possibly criminals. and. Just as a routine matter, we uh, we handed over the logs, and sometimes they wanted more logging on people, and we did more logging on people and handed it over. Um, given that legitimate uh, uh, legitimate providers can presumably be faced with a subpoena for whatever types of information are required, uh, and presumably they could also build a chain of, we get a subpoena to you, we get a subpoena to the DNS provider, we get a subpoena to the various websites we think you're going to, uh, and they could even walk along Tor networks, things like that, give subpoenas to everybody and shut them down if they don't like it. Is this, uh, is this, uh, is the narrowness of the focus on this particular uh, avenue of discovery, uh, is it too narrow? Uh, like what, what exactly are we getting by, by worrying about, the, uh, about this particular technology? So, so warrants need to be specific. Um, they need to list what exactly they're searching for. And the danger here is that this is a warrantless uh, system and that law enforcement can simply run one of these and find out the location data of everyone, um, you know, in a certain area. Um, so that's both a general and not even a warrant. It doesn't require that specificity that a uh, court ordered uh, warrant would, would you know, uh, need. And so the danger here is that law enforcement can just track you without any court intervention as well. Um, and for that matter, if someone else got their hands on one of these devices, anyone else can too. Um, so that's kind of, uh, the danger and the, you know, the amount that these are deployed then allows you say like, you know, in every city, you know, if, if this was deployed broadly by every law enforcement in every city, for instance, uh, and someone was to go from, um, as I did, Oakland to Atlanta, then, you know, um, there would be the possibility of tracing someone's movements across an entire, you know, geographic region. Um, we have no evidence to suggest that there, I'm not saying that that's happening, that we have the evidence to suggest that this is being deployed uh, as widely as it could, but I think there is certainly um 
a willingness by law enforcement to deploy these kind of things on a basis which is which it which uh doesn't isn't um uh, doesn't go through the rigmarole of a court system hey thanks for the talk curious what needs to be happening to combat the apathy or hopelessness or other blocks to effective organizing and action to protect people from this kind of abuse yeah so there are a number of contexts which activism on the technological realm can be really effective one is forms like this and having these discussions and uh, uh, informing the public about the fact that this is happening another great forum for these kind of discussions is things like hackerspaces um, bringing up these issues in the context of a hackerspace where you have a technologically minded um, focus and generally concern about the overreach of law enforcement and the uh you know a, a willingness to do something about it um i think that those kind of contexts are important um but it takes time and it's not something that changes overnight and it can be frustrating when it doesn't um but i think that it's important to remember that uh, change is a process and not a uh, switch I was wondering if you could speak more to going beyond the law enforcement overreach side of this, but mm -hmm. the, the fact that these are just devices and there's, as you listed, I think eight more companies such as that are making these, obviously not all of them maybe are doing the best job of verifying that who they're selling to is actually law enforcement because there's a bunch of local police all over the country. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to just generally like what's what's been found out, what's had, what's been seen in terms of confirmed cases of this falling in the hands of criminals, because obviously if you can downgrade to 2G and start decrypting everything live, uh, two-factor pins still are sent over SMS, and we're, we're not, we haven't gotten away from that yet. Yeah. Well, let's speak to a little bit about the protections that you take. I mean, I'm not sure about any documented instances of MC catchers being used by criminals. It's certainly possible, but uh, I don't, uh, I, I haven't heard of any instances where that's happened. Um, some of the protections that you can take are to, for your data, uh, to encrypt everything, um, you know, make sure that you're using good encryption, um, make sure you're using something like um, a browser which protects your privacy that isn't going to make spurious connections to wherever, um, one of the great ones is Brave. I uh, recommend using uh, Privacy Badger in your phone as well. And that will limit the amount of connections that your phone is making um, so that, you know, the unencrypted connections aren't indicative of where you've been on the web, right? Um, limiting the amount of apps that you, that are communicating the background, that's another uh, great uh, uh, kind of thing to do in general. Um, yeah, using, you know, ensuring that you are using the latest and greatest, um, encryption and by vetted apps that have kind of, um, you know, been looked at and, you know, uh, for instance, Brave Browser and others like that. Um, yeah, generally nowadays, luckily we've kind of largely succeeded in some, in, in, I would say in this hemisphere, um, with encrypting the web, right? Um, but that's not necessarily true in all of the world yet. Um, we <laughs> to, had some criticism of the fact that we kind of declared victory on uh, HTBS actually being everywhere because in China, they're still not encrypting large parts of the web and they use kind of um, encryption for uh, their kind of uh, you know keystrokes that are opportunistically looking for um, you know, uh, autocomplete for uh, for a very complex uh, uh, autocomplete for um, characters in uh, in Chinese. So, yeah, there's there's some portions of the web that still needs some, or portions of the internet that still need some work in getting encryption there. Um, so, use strong encryption wherever possible. I would say <laughs> is one way to protect against uh, data being snooped by. MC catchers that are that are looking at that that data. 
And that doesn't help with the location port part of it, though. Yeah, yeah so I've, I've read that um, even beyond uh, downgrade attacks and things like that, even if your phone's off and you have airplane mode and whatever, they're still somehow able to intercept things. Um, and that the only surefire way could be a, a, um, a Faraday bag. And but even that might sort of make you a bigger target and draw suspicion because they just see a phone and then it goes dark and then they see it pop up somewhere else. So um, I was wondering if you could talk about how uh, how law enforcement sort of deals with uh, Faraday bags or your thoughts on that. So Faraday bags come in a range of qualities. Um, some will be manufactured well and will protect your communications from actually having anything sent out. And some are kind of crappy and will leak um, some of that data. Uh, and so a parity bag is some good. I mean, if you are um, really looking to, in some contacts, protect uh, your data, then you can turn into airplane mode, put it in a parity bag, and uh, that kind of you you know, that, that level of paranoia might be something that is appropriate um, for your peace of mind. Um, I generally uh, don't do that. I, um, if uh, there is a, I think that like, you know, if you're in a protest situation kind of thing, then um, certainly if you have biometric unlock, then, uh, you know, making sure that you have, uh, you turn your phone off and then turn it on again, or for instance, so I have a biometric unlock that um, can be turned can can uh, force me to type in my full uh, device passphrase just by on the iPhone tapping on the side buttons on the uh, you know uh, high volume uh, and power together and then it'll bring up this screen which says to power off emergency then hit cancel and then I am forced to type in my password again uh, my full password so I have a long full password and then I have biometric unlock for convenience um, and if I'm you know in a context where you know there there is a protest situation happening around me then I will generally just do that and not, not unlock it um, until I'm out of that situation just in case that I drop my phone or um, you know it's confiscated and um, the range of Law enforcement techniques once your device is confiscated uh, is is um it's a uh, technologically uh, there are forensic imaging devices um, that are manufactured by for instance uh, gray shift which is based in, here in Atlanta and um, there's one uh, by Celebrite which is called a universal forensic extraction device UFED and they can um, do a uh, logical extraction, which means that it's getting particular parts of particular apps. Um, they can do a physical extraction. That means that it's like taking your disk contents bit by bit. Um, and that's generally not very useful unless they have the deep decryption key for that disk. Um, I shouldn't say disk. I should say a drive now. But, um, uh, and, uh, you know, there's also... Uh, uh, file system uh, extraction, which is generally kind of the most useful for law enforcement. So they can, for instance, get the, at the databases of your browsing history, um, you know, have your photos, et cetera, uh, available to them. Um, you know, this isn't the talk about extraction devices, so I don't want to get into that too much, but um, there is, a, a, you know, a protections that you can take, which is to uh, enable, if you're, well, iPhones have had it since like uh, iPhone 5S, but strong full disk encryption uh, with a uh, secure enclave coprocessor um, that's available in all iPhones now. Um, and disk encryption is available by contract with any Android device that has Google apps on it uh, by default. And so um, those are, uh, you know, using, I think that the, the main thing is using a, a very strong passphrase in order to uh, lock down your device in those cases. Quick, quest, quick question about the Faraday bag. Mm -hmm. Can tinfoil work? Just wrap your 
Uh, I've heard anecdotally that it works um, somewhat, but I can't speak to how reliable it is. Um, I've heard anecdotally that it works, but I'm not sure if I would recommend it necessarily over uh, an actually well-constructed Faraday bag. Thank you. And uh, you mentioned a couple of settings on the Pixel phone. Mm -hmm. Are those settings exclusive to Pixel? Samsung doesn't have them? So I think that, uh, well, I'm using uh, Pixel as a reference point for the, that kind of generation of, of support for Android operating system. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know exactly the version of uh, Android that started implementing this, but latest Android phones should have a setting to turn off to g Okay. I'm going to take the floor here. Uh, there is a setting on my phone that says, hey, you can auto connect to 5G, 4G, all the way to 2, then LTE all the way to 2, and then 3G all the way to 2, but there is nothing that I can mm -hmm. see so far that says, don't use 2. G right. Whatsoever. Yeah. So, so it might not be available for your phone. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Android 12. Android 12. I... Okay. Thank you. Uh, since the start of the session, I took a quick look uh, on the web uh, regarding going to uh, lockdown mode on my iPhone uh, and uh, sort of indicated that well, you probably don't want to do this unless you have some reason to think you're in an extreme situation or, or, or something like that and that there could be perhaps consequences without delineating what those might be that something else might not work when you needed it to work. Are you able to elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. So. Lockdown mode has a range of protections, which gives you a greater degree of security for the trade-off of some usability. Um, so, for instance, when you are visiting a site on your browser, then a lot of sites use custom fonts in order to kind of provide icons, and that won't necessarily work. Um, and it, the site looks kind of messed up um, because of that. And there are ways, are, and then, you know, for instance, and the reason for that is that font rendering engines are often kind of a particularly uh, vulnerable part of the operating system and arbitrar arbitrarily kind of offering a font over the web uh, would be... Um, is, isn't seen as, it's just seen as a, an, an extra vector of uh, possible intrusion. Mm -hmm. So that's why they turn that off for lockdown mode. Um, in addition, you uh, aren't able to display PDFs uh, unless you are selectively disabling it for a site. So as I kind of recommended Brave Browser, if I go to a site that has a download of a PDF, then um, it's not going to actually go and download it. So I need to selectively like share and copy that into Safari browser. Um, and then Safari, you can disable a particular site, um, the use of lockdown in a particular site. So there are some usability annoyances for sure with lockdown mode. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. You mentioned fonts as a vector. So let's just say you enabled uh, dyslexia font for library books or something like that. Does that just leave an open sticky tab so that whenever you're looking at any kind of site, it says, are you receptive to dyslexia font? They then can shake hands and there's the access or is it just location specific, only the library? I'm not aware of the dyslexia font feature. Um, I can't really speak to that. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of incredible what, sometimes when you hear about vulnerabilities that are a result of a rendering engine uh, failure. For instance, um, Microsoft has MS-06067, that was in 2006, uh, and that vulnerability was because of an icon, like the ICO file for a uh, a site that you that you visit and you go just simply going to a site um, that has a vulnerable icon would lead to full system compromise and so that is really just to me just 
incredible um, that those rendering engine vulnerabilities can um, fully compromise a site. And the industry in terms of kind of security engineering and thinking that um, is still in not a great place, but it's become more of the standard curriculum for computer science majors to have at least one course in security and to have security at least in the back of their minds when they're uh, when they're uh, coding. Um, there, you know, that, that kind of, um, you know, there's a range of new operating system or sorry, new uh, programming languages that are memory safe, um, like Rust and type safe. There's, you know, uh, when programming in uh, JavaScript, uh, if you're in JavaScript, then there's um, TypeScript, which is type safety, provides type, type safety. So there are, it's an evolving field and the, I'd say that the protections are getting better, but also the, the attacks are getting better. So, um, so it's kind of uh, just the way that uh, vulnerabilities have evolved over time. Yeah, there was also a vulnerability for uh, like if people have uh, built their own computer and yeah, they have the, the icon that comes up and shows the logo for the company that makes it. They found a way to hack into that. So they suggested turning it off. I think they may have patches out now for that, but a yeah, logo fail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a, a bypass to secure boot. Yeah. Uh, so that was a, uh, yeah subverting kind of some of the mechanisms that they uh that they use to kind of lock down the secure the uh the boot process yeah that's so that gets down into the bios so that gets under the operating system so you know and and they have others that <laughs> get down you know to that, to that low level also that um i think there's one out for amd processors i forget the details of it but it kind of links in there and if i think if you get that they suggest just, just getting rid of the processor because there's no way to get it out it, it i think it gets into the uh, microcode or something right so so bringing that back to mc catchers too um you know just uh be wary if you are going to be installing a custom rom on say an android phone like lineage os or something like that um it often requires you to disable some security features in order to install that operating system. Um, so I wouldn't say don't do it because uh, I think that it's uh, you know, great that there's innovation and it's great that people are looking to um, create reliable custom ROMs, but it does to say, you know, you are required to disable uh, some functionality of trusted boot in uh in android in order to to uh install those um, custom roms so if you're looking to be protected against say a boot attack uh on your phone your phone is confiscated and you want to uh, make sure that it's not being tampered with when it's confiscated or stolen um, then you might consider just kind of keeping uh, a good reliable uh, android phone uh, and not installing a custom ROM on it. Um, that's, uh, you know, it's a trade-off in your choice, right? Um, but yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, you know, one more thing back on the subject of uh, MZs. Um, this is something I'd, I I used to work in wireless telecom, so this is something I'd heard about a while ago. I don't like have the proof right here on me, but I had heard that AT and T got hit a long time ago with somebody uh, hacking into their MZs, and because of that, they switched their billing over to be based on the mobile number instead of the MZ. So. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I've heard that. Well, um, thank you very much for coming. Oh, we got another question. Sorry. <laughs> so I was just curious for a little more information on like the uh, sort of the operating characteristics of these stingrays. Like what's their range? You know, what kind of range do they have? Do they do you have to are they used with other things like jammers or how you know, how do they succeed in getting the phones to connect. 
Yeah. So the range of the devices will vary based on their kind of um, the, the the way that they're set up. Um, for instance, there's Stingray, which are like kind of larger devices, and I also mentioned things like the Kingfish, which is like a kind of smaller uh, handheld device, and that's going to range a lot. I don't have the I don't have the range of those devices specifically offhand, but um, and there's like a within a yeah I don't know exactly how how and I don't know uh, I I know that there's documentation on it uh, if you look it up and you can kind of get that yeah actually actually I'd heard that uh, actually this had first started quite a while ago that somehow the software uh, for actual cell towers got leaked out and at first people were doing building these based on just basic linux and using the hardware along with those and people decided to go and you know productize it and this is the result of it so it basically looks like a cell tower and since they have the opera the source code to it they can go and make changes to it and they can you know you can't say how big it's going to be because it's this is how they big they, they decide to make it how powerful they make it so right yeah it can be kind of arbitrarily large and yeah. um the 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 realm of Linux, like uh, of um of just open source um you know uh, uh software defined radios is really uh a kind of interesting and amazing really uh realm you have like usrps which are um is gen generally before smaller uh, sdrs came out they, these radio boxes that you can um buy and then you can put um daughter boards they're called onto the uh usrp and then have it operating within a certain range uh and uh Kenny radio uh, one of our uh founders at eff john gilmore is a uh, very involved with uh, starting GNU radio and um, that um, you know it allows you to kind of program radio functionality. Uh, there's other kind of smaller and somewhat less capable, although pretty capable still, uh, like Blade RF and Hack RF. These are two different, maybe um, you know, one step uh, lower devices. And then there's um, you know kind of run of the mill uh, SDRs, which have been Kind of, some of them are just TV tuners. You plug it in, and originally it was intended to pick up TV, right, and then display it on your screen. And someone had been able to reverse engineer how that signal is translated into uh, that you know the arbitrary bits that are received on the radio uh, are translated into a picture and repurpose that device in order to be a generic receiver so you have buy some ten dollar sdr and you're able to um, pick up radio signals from you know uh, 300 megahertz to 3000 and really neat there's a lot of innovation in that space too any other questions well thanks very much oh yeah well not really a question, but because somebody earlier asked about DIY Faraday bags, yeah. I'm a physicist, so the answer is tinfoil is perfectly acceptable. Um, the only real gotcha is you want to line it with some sort of non-conductive cushioning so that the phone isn't touching the tinfoil. And other than that, tinfoil is as good or better than most things that commercial Faraday bags are made out of. With the one caveat, don't let your phone start poking holes through the tinfoil because then you get into trouble. But no, tinfoil, absolutely acceptable for a Faraday bag if you want to do one on the fly. I've heard of a tra I heard of trash cans that can do the same thing yeah. like burns and stuff. Yeah, some. like metal trash cans. Yeah. If you're uh as paranoid as as I sometimes am about um, you know national security and things like that and EMP attacks and um, then you can buy 
one of these trash cans and then just throw some of the, so throw a blanket in it and then throw some of the important electronics that have say pre-downloaded maps of your entire region on it and then just forget about it and then you'll have the assurance that at least a peace of mind that uh you know someday in the future uh, when you might need it um say even if you have a power outage um then um you uh have something there that you can refer to um i could go into a whole prepper kind of yeah. thing but uh but i won't <laughs> well yeah well yeah i do have 10 minutes <laughs> the thickness of the metal helps so if you want to be really extra secure by heavy duty a little uh -huh. You, you um you know don't have the reliability if uh, there is a significant disruption these are you know some one of those kind of sane scenarios to maybe prepare for is a um we're you know 2024 is a year which on the sol on the solar cycle uh we're kind of a, a witnessing uh large solar flares and those solar flares can be disruptive to terrestrial uh electrical grids um it most often results in like just beautiful aurora borealis um that is as far as is south as atlanta i understand um but uh it could result in some um disruption of electrical grids so uh one thing that you might have disruption of is also gps satellites um and yeah, uh, I, for instance, have a thing called Organic Maps. Uh, you can download the app and Organic Maps and then just download all of Georgia, Florida, and North Carolina, and Tennessee, and just ha like have, and it's only say like, um, I know Nevada uh, is like 30 megs, and California is like more like 700, but um, it's not that much space that's taken up on your phone, and you will have a good map that's reliable you know if you say are navigating and you don't have a uh, signal and um you know you are trying to navigate a lot you know if you if you lose signal and google maps is still going basically if you set it but say you exited google maps for some reason just randomly or your phone shut off because of it was overheating or something then you can turn on your phone again and then just navigate with this uh organic maps it uses open street maps um and you have that pre-downloaded on your phone so in some situation which you can imagine that uh, disrupts um that causes some some uh uh you know disruption then you have a peace of mind of having at least some map really detailed maps available to you it's a it's an app yeah yeah you can just download um organic maps it's on it's in both android and uh and uh ios um store anyway not to get too preppery <laughs> <laughs> well thanks very much uh and uh enjoy the rest of your con